there was a show at uh, that Constance Mells put together. A lot of you saw it. It was at the Pasadena Museum last January. It was up at this time, Cali Pasadena Museum of California Art, which now is closed. And the concept that um, Constance was building was that um, sublime being traditionally male uh, was where the artist, like Friedrich and so on, were looking out at a threatening situation, such as um, a storm coming or a fire or some threatening, overwhelming force. The sublime is a force that would be destabilizing and that the artist would be confronting this and it would be a you know, subject-object, you know, it would be a confrontation between the male um, viewer and the um, threat or the overwhelming um, sublime situation, which sometimes is mostly seen as a natural cataclysmic event or something. And that there was a depiction or a re reconciliation that the artist and the threat were that the artist was overcoming that, that they were able to handle it, that either their ego could hold up to it or that they were able to parallel it some way. And so the concept, not my concept, but the concept of the feminine sublime is that because the sublime is about destabilization, you know, that there's something so overwhelming, and now we're talking about technological sublime, not even like the environment, because that's pretty sublime too, the fires and the floods and everything like that, I've also been responding to those, you know, cataclysmic um, increasing changes in the environment. But the feminine sublime is where the, um, and it doesn't have to be female painters, it can be anyone who wants this sort of point of view, is that you're immersed in the trouble. So you're in with it and you don't try to overcome it, you don't try to stand up to it, you just realize you're participating with it and you're one with it period. And that also sort of parallels the thinking of um, some of the writers who write about the Anthropocene. You guys have heard of Anthropocene, which is what we're in right now. And one of the writers is um, Timothy Morton, who wrote Dark Ecology. Could, could you define Anthropocene just in case somebody... Uh, Anthropocene means that like it's an epic that we're living in, in which everything has been changed because of the workings of mankind on the environment. That there is just nothing anymore that is going on with that, that has been tinged or changed because of our impact. And that some of the people who write about this are talking about reparations, like we need to pay back to the species and to the world, like the damage we've done. And so one of the um, writers, um, Donna Haraway, she also writes, uh, she wrote Cyborg, Cyborg something or other. Do you have that book? Cyborg something? You would like it. And she also writes a book right now called Staying with the Trouble, which is sort of like that. It's like, okay, we're in this. We're in trouble. But it's not something we're going to fix. It's not something that is outside of us because we are immersed and everything is meshed and everything is entangled. So it's a lot about complex entanglement and tenacular, like tentacles of things connecting through um, species and time periods and, and just sort of dealing with the ultimate darkness of this with humor. And that's a part of that whole theory. So I'm, not, I'm going off on other things that inform my work, but the feminine sublime is, um, you know, that, that you're just, you're in with this turmoil and you're a part of it, and that's part of, you're not gonna change it, you're not gonna master it. That the sub, male sublime was about mastery over a threat. You know, so that was like, you know, um, is that good enough? Uh, yeah, I, okay. yeah, and so, <laughs> and I, I was thinking about this, because this distinction was made, I think, in the, in the writings about that show, um, and it seems to be really exemplified by that Casper David Friedrich painting of the Wanderer in the Mist. Yeah, you know, the guy on the rock looking out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, so it's at once sort of too vast to comprehend, and yet there's a centralized subjectivity that seems to have a handle on it somehow. Yeah. And that maybe rationality might, right. might pr prevail. Um, and, and it made me wonder about the historically like machismo association with artists like Pollock. 
who I've always thought of as being inside the painting. Yeah, I mean, I would totally entangle the mesh is there, the entanglement, even de Kooning, there's a lot of, if you don't look at the, you know, the women so much, but de Kooning's like, you know, totally enmeshed into that, the trouble zone. So I think that, yeah, I mean, it's something that this sort of concept has only been discussed in literature and in film. So it's like brand new, like what is the feminist sublime in painting? And it's not something that actually there are any books or anything about. There's very few articles about it. But generally the sublime is related to landscape. You know, like so if you like there's this woman in Scotland who's a professor and she wrote to me and she's interested and she's out in the mountains writing about it and painting about it. And so there's some some people are starting to think about is there a different way to look at the sublime. Yeah. Do you think it's worthwhile to um, reconsider the uh, associations of machismo with some of the, even Barnett Newman, who I feel like it is an attempt to immerse, to be Yeah, I mean, that, that's like modernism, but I think when we look, think about this, well, I mean, Rothko talked about the sublime a lot. Rothko really was into, you know, the threshold and then the sublime space beyond that, you know. Um, but I think we're, with this, it, again, couching it back into landscape, like landscape, what, what is the view we're doing, how are you immersed in it, and not so much like there are a lot of other kinds of sublime, like, um, you know, the sticky sublime, technological sublime, the abstract sublime. You said the sticky sublime? That's the name of the book, the sticky sublime. Oh. Huh? Yeah. The sticky sublime. Yeah. Oh, so, so I have a, I have another slew of questions, uh -oh. um, but I wanted to pause and ask for questions. Isn't it, okay? So this is sort of about the work, and then I have questions that are sort of about like, how do you get from you know where all of you sort of are approximately on all of you in the same place to your place? You know, like given that whole journey. So that's sort of like the life of the artist questions, but. I wanted to see if anybody had any thoughts or questions about just the, the, the work. Generally, because I know you paint so many different paintings all the time, but generally, what is your formal process? What is my, um, like, how do I, like, process in terms of in the studio? Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's a like, narrow that down a little. Like, like, do you look at imagery first and then get inspired? Do you paint a color field and then find imagery? And... Yeah, well, the imagery is something I'm always hunting. I have all kinds of imagery on my computer and print it out. And transparencies, I use transparencies, like old-fashioned projector, and just put them on so I get different arrangements, you know, so that's projected. But I start with color fields and then just a horizon line. So if I start a series, it's just like a horizon line for couple weeks and then after that a vertical line <laughs> I mean it starts out really really formal and then it's like shapes you know and then it's other shapes and then all hell breaks loose sort of right so it starts out very very formally and then also I try to draw and paint at the same time so I don't get too away from the imagery because I would just go into like formal land and then I feel bereft if I'm there and I feel bereft if I have too many pictures in the works I want to find in between, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this looks like it's two, the two canvases. Too. Yeah, it's two canvases. Uh, is that uh, like from the beginning you kind of had that idea or, or as you were painting one did you want I to I painted stand? the left side. Yeah. first, okay. most of it, and I just, you, you know, it's because I had the canvas in the studio, and then um, that sat around for a year, and I did all those other really large paintings, I had six shows this year, so I just did lots of big paintings, crazy, and then I pulled it out, and I'm like, that's kind of interesting, but it'd be better if I had another side, so I made that one and, yeah. put it, and started to work them together. So it kind of grew from the left to the right. And I think the left was inverted that way, you know? So it kind of just pieced uh -huh. together. 
Yeah. I just want to remind all of you that, you know, since you're always in this situation in the, in, in the reverse, where you're sitting there and you've got all your work up and you're feeling vulnerable, <laughs> and we're firing questions at you. This is your chance. <laughs> <laughs> right, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> to flip the script <laughs> to uh, print a table. Um, I have a question about your drawings. I feel like I've, they're, for me, at least they are uh, uh, newly acquainted to me. Um, I, I, I'm curious about your thoughts in the, um, in the whole sort of uh, drawing versus painting method in terms of um, do you feel like one, one holds more weight than the other? Um, or, you know, I see that these are a group of drawings that sort of occupy this entire wall. Do you see you making a drawing, perhaps, you know, this scale and showing it? Maybe. Well, actually, most of my drawings are black and white. And the curator chose the colored drawings because he wanted it about color. And so I made a few more for the show. But generally, my drawings are pretty dark. And they're black and ink. And, you know, I have tons of drawings that are black and white in the studio. So I w was going to show those, but he wanted the, you know, the color to pull together. So I, I started to work more with the bright color, which was about atmosphere. And, but usually, generally, they're more, um, you know, a lot more line work, a lot more struggle in them than you see in these. These so are almost you, like little paintings. So do you feel like your paintings, for you, carry a little more weight, um, maybe psychologically, or? Um, to your process? No, I think the drawings are more direct and I think they're actually more successful and they always have been. This is cool. this thing. Drawing is always like 10 years ahead of your painting. Mm. And so at once, one point I thought, well, I'll just quit drawing. That way my paintings will always be better. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's not a good idea. So I, I mean, the drawings are always better because they're just get to the point quicker and they're more graphic. You know, um, even at the opening, everybody's like, your drawings, they're like so much, they're so, I like your drawings best. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> right, shut up. I'm trying really hard with the paintings, too. Okay, question? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that you work simultaneously with painting and drawing at the same time, do you ever feel like one carries to the other, or vice versa, like your drawing inspires this painting, or, or like, hey, this was my idea, now I'm going to put it on here? Um, the drawing feeds the painting. If I stop drawing, the painting gets really stale. So it's a matter of like trying to do both. Do you ever like work out a painting on like by drawing first, or do you kind of? Oh no! Like I mean, the painting is just you know hello hello, and then it's like <laughs> over the deep end, and then I'm having fun, right? So there's no way of controlling it. I mean, it's just kind of I think we're opposite in that way. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like. A heavy risk and heavy, you know, adventure. But, um, you know, the drawings are kind of charming to me. Like, it's like they can be poignant, they can be really mysterious. But I, I guess I get the tensions and the imagery and maybe a little bit of interest in what I want to go after in the painting. But the painting usually, you know, takes its own, takes its own course. So, yeah. So do you feel like the drawings are more successful, but the paintings are more successful in the sense of an experience? Different experiences. I think maybe the drawings hit the mind, like the intellect more, because it's closer to writing, it's closer to depiction, and the paintings hit the gut and the body and the breathing a little bit more. Yeah, so I think that's very insightful. I think two different experiences, yeah. So I really see these paintings as like your paintings, you know, I look at them and they're like really unique to you. Do you feel like after all these years that like you're making the paintings that you've like been trying to make, you know, like this is like you've arrived at your kind of thing that you really want to no. <laughs> None of that satisfaction, none of that joy. <laughs> I mean, none of that security, none. I mean, I'm just still like you guys every day. It's like, oh, I mean, why? In there, it was just tortured my back. <laughs> oh God, you know. And then, the, so I guess part of the seduction is seducing myself to do it. But then, you know, there are, you know, what's going to make me paint this thing? Well, I'm pink in today. So there, you know, just like that kind of <laughs> rationalization. 
And then, you know, then if you sustain it long enough, then you actually get in that world, and it's really rewarding. But I don't feel it's anywhere near really what I, it's too, there's way too much hiddenness in my work. I need a little more rational thought, I think. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I don't, I don't feel sad, no way do I feel satisfied. With it at all. No. So there's some duality in your work, particularly you mentioned that too much beauty can actually um, hinder a lot of the themes in your work. And it's something that I feel like I've been worried about with my own work. So I was wondering, like, in terms of balancing that and knowing when you're being contrived and knowing when, um, even in collage work, when you're just putting elements together but not properly synthesizing them um, and what you have to say. Tension, I mean, tension's a big one. And for you, since you're interested in beauty, you know, yeah. I'm going to give you that book to read on beauty. There's two or three books. But you just got to watch out for pretty. I know. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So pretty is just like, I mean, pretty can be really intense if it's overwhelming, but beauty is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Beauty can be devastating, you know. Beauty is can be elegant. There's nothing wrong with beauty. Sublime is destabilizing. Beauty is stabilizing, you know, and it can be a little bit destabilizing. It's so beautiful, it's breathtaking, right? Right. We see that in films and so much, you know. So beauty's good. It's just a different thing than the sublime. Mm -hmm. Does this? Do these terms sort of float around in the same? Like uh, orbit as terms like um, the decorative or, or design, sort of the in, the inverse of these terms. Like you made a distinction between pretty and, be and beautiful. Um, and then you know I, I've heard, I certainly heard the word illustration brought up in a negative sense in relation to painting a lot. Um, yeah. And I feel like that's a complicated subject, just given pre-modern painting in its illustrative function. Um, and then it seems like the the shadow that sometimes gets cast over abstract painting or mildly hybridized abstract painting <laughs> is, is its tendency towards devolving into design or the decorative. Yeah, I mean design, I mean <clears throat> my friend Linda, who I always talk about, amazing painter, she was all about designing paintings. It's like paintings, if they're going to be smart, they need to be designed. And they have to have a sense of design, where they are in the culture, and <clears throat> I don't design paintings, you know, I dance with them until they become a structure, basically, but I think that is a good strategy, if that's your, you know, psychology, if that's your point of view, design can be amazing, you know, to like really give it stylistics and design, I mean, that's, that's a way of creating, you know, really distinct work, too. So you, you don't think, you, you don't use that as a... Uh... Derogatory. Derogatory. No. And there's no hierarchy between beauty and sublime. Beauty and sublime are just different things. There's no hierarchy there. I mean, beauty is one thing. I mean, I wanted to do a whole course of beauty because I have like all these books and all these great essays on it. Beauty is an incredible, powerful thing. But sublime is, is, is a different side of beauty. It has seduction, but it's more about, you know, um, destabilizing, overwhelming, you know. There's there's a lot of stuff to read on it, but they're not, um, you know, opposite. It, traditionally, beauty was female and sublime was, you know, masculine. But now it's like, you know, that doesn't, that, those things don't matter. That was just historically. Who do you, who do you think is the kind of, who comprises the audience of, of people who want to have these stabilizing aesthetic experiences? Is there any way to generalize about that? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I wish I had more of an audience that could get or understand the work. I don't think painters, painters get it. So, training everybody in here. The painters get it, but I don't think, you know, not a lot of people will get it. I mean, as far as destabilization, architects love it, you know, because they get structures and break down structures and, you know, what do you think? Um, well, you know, I spent some time on the Central Coast and saw more 
um, paintings of uh, rolling hills and vineyards than any person should have to. <laughs> um, and I feel like one of, even though you know the artists who made these paintings were perfectly lovely people and some of them sophisticated thinkers in other ways, it seemed to me like the, there was this attempt in the painting to, to uh, suppress everything that was contradictory or ugly about life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I felt like there was probably a noble version of that or, or an honorable version of that, a kind of purification of life that maybe somebody like Mondrian is pursuing. Um, but that there was also a kind of debased version of it where the painting felt a lie to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, um, you know, I think that that's for me when I feel like I'm, you know, it's sort of like the way nostalgia operates. Nostalgia just somehow manages to always clean out everything that was, you know, this is why Make America Great Again is such a sort of, in my mind, kind of a, a toxic phrase because there, it conceptualizes. And I'm not meaning to be, you know, political and overtly here, but it conceptualizes of, of there having been a state of the country that had, had been purged of all of strife and, and you know oppression yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I feel like to see uh, destabilization manifested in, in works of art is to to have um, this this feeling, this hope that what is corrupt about the world can be redeemed. Because the disabled, yeah. because the, the, the disabilization, if in a, here I'm gonna bring back to beauty, if disabilization can be beautiful, then in some ways, you know, what is corrupt can be, can be redeemed. Right, probable. ooh, that was smart. <laughs> I like that, right? So that it's also the destabilization is a signifier for change. It's a basically, and that goes back to the machine and the movement, and I think that's a part of what I hope for in the content of the work, is that, you know, you recognize something, you feel you, you can ground yourself in that, but it, it keeps shifting. That can happen so many ways with painting, too. I mean, even if, like, Dana, like, think about a still life, like how you're destabilizing with the repetition and the fracture of you know, I mean, just that alone is another mechanism for that. Or just, you know, the, um, who had that beautiful passage up above I saw on Monday? I'm trying to think. I don't know, I forget which student it was. But, I mean, you know, like just in, in material means with the brushstroke, that can be very subtle and still be destabilizing. Right? Or even yours is probably like optical. You know, with the structures, but just how you modulate the color and the light. That can be like yes, no, yes, no, you know. So. I think you should give me a show here and then we can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. That would be great. We should do that. <laughs> Put you in the hot seat. <laughs> so the, I, I thought that this, this question that Chris asked in, in your response, I thought it was extremely interesting because it, it sort of plowed right into the, the part two about like, you know, what is the, the journey between being a young, a young artist and I don't know how to put it in a way that, that you know, I don't know, mature artists or a, a fully realized artist. Um, and and I, I want to make all sorts of caveats here because, of course, not all student artists are the same. I mean, there are actually people who make the best the best work they're ever going to make. They make in their in their twenties, possibly. I mean, I think it's rare, but it's it is not that rare that there are artists who make the best work they're ever going to make when they first become famous. And so I'm going to name a name here. I'm going to say Eric Fischel. I think Eric Fischel has never got never made paintings as good as the first ones that made them well known, um, and and they just keep keep getting worse. <laughs> I mean, that's always a risk, and I mean, yeah, it's always a risk, right? So that's one caveat about being a young artist. It doesn't mean necessarily mean that you were just like, you know, gelatinous, unformed, you know, whatever. Um, but I remember um, certainly my experience of, of 
being a student and and just on one hand, you know, pursuing whatever local local proximate pursuit I was doing, the painting at hand, and on the other hand, just knowing that I had big problems. And one of them would have been, in my case, being just incredibly derivative of other artists. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't really actually know anything about that art for you, but you know, since you set up an, an equivalence, you say like, you know, I am like you. I go in there. I'm doubtful every day. I like, I'm, you know, facing the same the same dragon and different, you know, maybe in different forms. Um, but certainly there has been, certainly there has been a change or many changes. Many changes. And, many changes. And I would say that certainly there's been this. There have been moments when you became more fundamentally more confident. Mm -hmm. And, fun, and, and maybe moments when you felt fundamentally like much more like you own the work, like like this is my work, nobody else's. Is that is that true? And then like, do you have anything to say about how you got there? Oh my god! <laughs> what time is it? We got a long time. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we have a little time. Okay, so. Um, I mean, it's, it's like, I mean, there's like a mentality when you have, you, when you're convict, you know, you have your, you make a commitment to this, it's conviction. And then from there on, there's a lot of doubt, there's everything in the world against you. So you just have to figure it's never, there's never going to be anything to support it, period. So you have to, to me, I had to claw my way through. I mean, it sounds, get out your own violin, because it's going to sound like, you know, <laughs> when I was young, oh my God. I mean, my parents disowned me when I was 18 because I wanted to be an artist. They said, if you go to art school, you're on your own, you're never getting a penny from us. Period, when I was 18. And I know some of you deal with that with your parents and with your families. I mean, I had to just work. The whole time I was in undergraduate school at Rhode Island School of Design, Sometimes I worked night shifts, two jobs, three jobs, and I just, you know, had my friends steal me food. I mean, this is like true. I had no money my whole life. <laughs> and I clawed my way through it. And, um, you know, then I finally moved to California from the East Coast, and, and um, everything was against me. You're never going to go to grad school. You're never going to be a painter. You're never this. And I'm like, then, you know, like in Buddhism, like, what's your noble friend? Like whatever obstacle, that's like that's your friend. So I got used to that idea. Like somebody go, no, you never, never, never get into grad school. I said, watch me. And so then I just got really determined and really, really determined. And so whenever there was something, I would just go at it until I could get it. It wasn't easy. I mean, it was, you know, living alone in a warehouse without water, and I mean, it was like really, really hardships. Tons of hardships. And hopefully you guys don't have to go through that. But you know, once I once I got beyond when I first got my first teaching job, you know, I could finally buy a truck that worked and get my work around. And you know, I mean, it was it was not easy. I did not have a silver spoon, and if I did, imagine where I would be now. But mm -hmm. it was it was a big struggle. Just just in terms of my own life, it was not easy. But. You know, as far as in the studio and practice day by day, it's a calling. Like, people talk about it like, is it a career or a calling? It's a calling. So if you see it as a calling, then it's easy. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I haven't painted now for like a month because, you know, I had a personal loss and the show is up and everything's up in the air. And it's just like, boy, is it boring. It's like, no, what do I do? Read? Okay. Oh, TV. I hate TV. What? Maybe I'll learn how to cook, or I'll do this, or I could clean out my drawers, or, you know, I mean, there's all this time to do stuff that it doesn't satisfy me, <laughs> you know, so I just want to get back in the studio because it's such an engaging, rewarding, mental, physical, total experience, you know. So um, I was lucky to have discipline very early on because I went to an art high school, I've told you guys about that. And my parents were supportive when I was in art school. They didn't want me to go any further than that. They were afraid. But, you know, so I had a discipline since I was 18 to just paint. And I was a plein air landscape painter, and so I was out painting, painting, painting. So it was such a habit growing up for me that it's a part of my uh, whole lifestyle, 
you know, it's integral. So, so, so it seems like there's some kind of, you're describing some kind of internal machine that pushes you forward that is the, the, the self that wants to. And then, yeah, then you get to this place where you're my age and it's like you have this whole career and it's like, you feel responsible to it. It's like, what about all those paintings up there? I'm just going to stop now? I mean, I should keep going. People have bought them. I, sh I, sh I can't just drop it, you know? <laughs> you know so like you have these kind of like dialogues, like there's still something you can paint, you know? You can still move forward. And it's like I've been painting for 40 years. You know, it's a long, long time of washing dirty brushes. <laughs> but um, you know what I mean? So it does, it gets, it's labor too. It's a lot of labor. And it's sort of like you get in a place in your life where you don't want to work so hard because you get tired. But you got to just get over that. It's, it's, it's hard work and it's discipline. You, you hear all this. But it has to be like, I mean, it's not something you can pick up and drop and pick up and drop. You know, it is a process that you have to keep alive, I think, on a daily basis. You know? So, um... If, well, if there were uh, a young artist sitting here today thinking, thinking to herself, like, oh, God, it never stops. The doubt never stops. I thought that there would be this thing. I'd have a BFA show that would have had the thing. Or I would have had my MFA show, then I would, and then I'd feel confident and walk, I'd walk around the world and feel like I, was, I, had, I found my place in it and so forth. Can, can you offer, offer anything about Sure, like, it's, it's, it's shifting ground, first of all. Like, you will get, like, acknowledgments. Like, when people buy my work or when they get it, like, certain critics or people will get it on such a deep level that it's like, oh, my God, I've communicated something very, very weird to this person and they got it, you know? It's a fabulous feeling. And it's also, like, a, like I always say, it's a pendulum that... You know, you work through a whole series and you get to the apex, you know, it's a moment where it's really great. You can't sustain it because it gets repetitive. 